We wanted to start off talking about uh, the dominant way that humans coordinate today in the global economy. The first uh, modern corporation is considered to be the Dutch East India Company because it had these three uh, key features, a separate legal personality. So instead of interfacing with uh, 500 shareholders, you're actually just interfacing with one legal entity. And in addition to this, liability of all the participants is limited to the, the money that they put into the enterprise. They can't be sued personally for, for more than that. And then stocks of the Dutch East India Company were tradable. So there was the Amsterdam Stock Exchange where uh, investors who, who bought shares could, could resell them even before uh, the company turned a profit, let's say, if they were uncertain of, the, of its future prospects. Here you kind of get the basic archetype of the corporation where you have uh, shareholders who contribute capital and they elect a board of directors, which then appoints uh, management, which then hires the employees. And what this has enabled is basically a separation um, from the ownership of the company and the actual day-to-day um, -day management of the company. And so you can get uh, more capital together and coordinate more capital and coordinate more labor uh, to do more capital intensive enterprises. And now we're just doing the same thing, but plastering it onto computer screens and databases. In parallel, another kind of big institutional upgrade of the 17th century was the notion of the sovereign nation state. And so before this point, there was kind of a mixed notion of who had uh, control over territories where the church being able to intervene in local affairs or a territory was part of an empire, there would be this kind of mixed sovereignty. Uh, but then after the, this, the Thirty Years' War, the Treaty of Westphalia kind of established the, the state of that area has its own monopoly of force over that, which other territories cannot legitimately intervene in. And relations between states happens through diplomacy, heads of states, you know, sign treaties, uh, declare war. We have also international bodies and a notion, uh, notion of international law where states are considered these like legal persons. And so today, yeah, today also, it's kind of the same deal, right? We have uh, heads of state who say, oh, this treaty has been broken and we're declaring war on this country. And so overall, we can think about this like joint stock company, nation state complex as the key primitives that have driven the industrial age. Uh, of course, there's many other forms out there, but these are the kind of dominant ones that uh, have international scope. And so quickly we can run through some alternatives you might be familiar with that have been out there, have been developed over many years, but are definitely not the core cornerstones of the economy. On the nation state side, you have areas that have their own uh, governance and that don't fit into that uh, Westphalian order. The alternatives to the dominant primitives are marginal and largely that's because the corporate uh, nation state complex is so uh, um, integral to the industrial age with, with industry having driven most economic activity uh, over the past 400 years. But obviously things have started to change uh, with the advent of computers, personal computing, and there's now more friction with the old primitives uh, because they're built around an old economic system. And so you start to see frictions with um, the networked world, right? Uh, corporations and nation states are, are, are struggling to deal with this. And many of these alternatives that have been on the margins are, are quickly you know, rising in prominence. So to kind of like break it down structurally, you have uh, industrial age, kind of um, you know, what we're most familiar with, the joint stock company, uh, its, its rules are encoded in, in legalese and legal documents. Uh, the execution environment it operates in is the nation state, right? You, you, you sue someone or with, with, within the company or you can sue the company and then you go to the court system of the, of the jurisdiction to have it uh, adjudicated. Um, and then you use judges, use police, use banks as the, as the agents to execute the processes. And there's the logic of, of hierarchy and bureaucracy that, that is consistent across all these different institutions within that complex. And then we're just the beginning of the digital age where this new economic primitive, this new kind of more open um, set of templates for doing economic activity where the encoding 
of the organization is actually software and the execution environment is a distributed database is, is like a blockchain and the actual uh, execution of those rules happens autonomously through the validators of the underlying chain. And of course the logic here is, is computer networks is uh, peer to peer designs. And so just to kind of summarize, you have corporations which have uh, their rules encoded in legalese in human language and enforced by the nation state and all its arms. And then uh, what's, what's starting to happen with DAOs is uh, these institutions that have their rules encoded in software and are autonomously executed on a computer network. The next thing to hop into is what really is a DAO? A DAO is kind of similar to crypto as a whole from many different views. When you look at it, it's something completely different. So here are just five um, kind of accepted definitions, a virtual entity with members that have the right to spend the entity's fund and modify its code, internet community with a shared bank account, rule-based organizational system, not controlled by central authority and where rules are algorithmic and internet-based organization collectively owned and controlled by its members. So something that's a pure DAO is controlled in a bottom-up way, doesn't have central control. Um, it's autonomous, uh, which would mean that it acts according to pre-encoded rules, uh, which can be modified by DAO members, but subject to a vote. And an organization uh, in so far as it coordinates resources to achieve a purpose. A DAO enables a digitally native way to make decisions and manage resources in the execution environment of a blockchain. It's instead of hierarchical, it's autonomous instead of bureaucratic, it's transparent instead of private, and it's borderless instead of nation bound. You can really participate or launch a DAO from anywhere. I'll quickly run through a topology of DAOs. And I think uh, today we have basically a really particular type that's become popular because it was easier to build, but this is meant to kind of like broaden the imagination for the, the design space. Uh, so we'll, yeah, we'll go through how the units of this kind of digital organization could be represented, how the units get distributed, who has the units, and what are the units actually used for. So first off, are the units tradable and are, are the units fungible? And so in the case of uh, most of the DAOs we know today, they're mostly in the first box of Yes, they're fungible, like the, all the units are the same, uh, they're replaceable, um, and yes, they're tradable. So this kind of looks a lot like a joint stock company or even just like um, uh, an internal currency. Uh, but, but there's also kind of like this unexplored design space of DAOs where units are not tradable, but they are fungible. So let's say a system where your units are dependent on your reputation, like your uh, Uber driver score, your Reddit karma, or your credit score, right? So all these different kinds of scores that could be internally tracked in an on-chain system. And then in the category of, of non-fungible, we can think about DAOs where the voting right is an NFT that's tradable. You can think of like an HOA uh, as an example of this, a DAO-fied HOA, like maybe, you know, the deed to your house is your, is your voting unit, but of course you can sell the deed of your house to someone else. Then we have other systems that look more like nation states where the ability to vote is unique to each person. For my passport's different from your, from your passport, uh, and we also can't trade it. So another example, this kind of crypto world is a uh, proof of attendance protocol, where if we're going to an event, you get issued a non-transferable NFT that shows that you went to that event, right? So then you can have organizations based on events that different people have gone to. And that's actually based on something you've done, uh, not something you can buy or trade. Similarly, the university diploma or uh, badges that prove that you've taken certain courses, enabling you to do things in different sorts of organizations. And that would be, again, a non-fungible, uh, it's like a unique uh, property that belongs to you, and it's also not uh, tradable. So then there's this question of the units getting allocated. So there's an initial supply uh, to maybe the team, the people who have been involved in building it before launch. And then um, people who have been like using whatever the service is that the organization is providing or, or a broader community <laughs> or partners uh, that are involved. Then you also have, if there's been, if there's been financing, then uh, there's the ability to like pre-purchase units, uh, just like in a, in a joint stock company. 
And then there's also this question of how the units distribute over time. Is there some sort of like algorithmic inflation, like you're doing valuable work for the network and you automatically get more units and they're, and they're kind of minted? Or can you also have the ability for the holders of the units to decide kind of manually to issue more units? And lastly here, like what, what are the units actually used for? And so in the joint stock company, the, the corporate form, we're really familiar with these first two, right? Like you have a, a Tesla stock. And so of course, um, if you have enough, you can, you can vote in corporate decisions. And also uh, if, the, if the company ever decides to give out dividends, you, you have a share of the, of the company's profit. So those are like the basic two fundamentals um, in the uh, joint stock company context. But then with uh, crypto units, you, have, you also have this ability to programmatically gate access to certain services, goods, content, uh, discussion boards, even physical events or virtual events through possession of the token. As far as where DAOs are currently, these first wave of DAOs, uh, I'd say up until 2021, focused on grant services, investments, and protocol governance. So for investments, for instance, you have the Lao, which uh, makes investments into different crypto projects. There's protocol governance DAOs, such as Gitcoin, Uniswap, Sushi, Compound, um, where people can vote on protocol upgrades and new features and partnerships. Uh, there are services DAOs like Dorg, and there are grants DAOs, such as Moloch, where you can apply to receive grants and kind of people have voting rights on where those grants should go. But what's been really exciting over the last year in particular is all of these new experiments. One that's made particularly a lot of news is the idea of single purpose acquisition DAOs. One newsworthy example of this is Constitution DAO where people came together and tried to buy the Constitution. Um, they ended up uh, losing, but they were able to onboard thousands of new users into DAOs and raised around $40 million in a short period of time. There are others uh, listed on the slide, such as Blockbuster DAO, um, to buy Blockbuster back from the current owners. Uh, there's Moon DAO, Spice DAO. Next is Social DAOs. Board Ape Yacht Club uh, has been particularly like well covered as far as you know, people with the Board Ape NFTs and now the Ape uh, token that launched. But um, having a board ape uh, not only gives you credibility, but also they'll have events for board ape yacht club holders. Friends with Benefits is another social DAO where you need to hold a FWB token in order to participate in the discourse, kind of aiming to be a decentralized Soho house. And then there's Orange DAO, which is crypto founders who went through Y Combinator. Another area that is science DAOs or DSI. And particularly the thesis is that in academia or in companies, resources for doing scientific research are not always the best allocated or follow very particular timelines. And there's been a growth in these new experiments, such as Vita DAO, Molecule, Psy DAO, and Lab DAO, which kind of all fund different areas in science. Uh, Vita DAO, which is perhaps uh, the most well known of these, is a DAO where people vote on longevity IP or biotech IP relating to the longevity space to acquire. And kind of you can also pitch VitaDAO with like a clinical trial that you might want to run. There are also territorial DAOs, whether it's uh, Catalan DAO or ATX DAO or City Coins, uh, which the city of Miami is working with. Many kind of exciting projects to kind of bring a city onto a DAO or use a DAO to acquire territory in some location like Akia DAO is doing in Japan. We also saw the rise of cause DAOs this past year. So you have Assange DAO, which uh, raised, I think, over $50 million for Julian Assange's legal fund. And then the contributors to that raise had the, the token they could use to govern and coordinate activities that they would do to further that cause. Similarly, on the bottom right, you have Ross DAO, which raised money uh, to purchase an NFT by Ross Albright. So to contribute to his uh, kind of like legal defense fund. Bottom left, you have DreamDAO helping onboard Gen Z to crypto, doing education, outreach. We wanted to highlight a few problem areas in DAO that might even be exciting for you all to work on. 
So here we have kind of two different proposals and both of these proposals are, are great and people are voting on them. But in both of these cases, what is missed is a sense of autonomously executing. For instance, in this Uniswap case of do, will they deploy their smart contracts on Moonbeam? Um, there's still a gap between the decision and the action. If Uniswap goes and deploys on Moonbeam, that then involves you know, the engineers at uh, Unilabs to then uh, put their smart contracts up as opposed to you know, this proposal gets passed and it kicks off uh, you know, the deployment uh, automatically. Similarly with the Protofy partnership proposal here, uh, more details are listed in the forum post for Terra, but it's kind of more or less saying like, hey, do we want to work with this other group? There's still the bureaucracy that's handled in that type of organization. So many DAOs are, are not particularly autonomous. They're also not particularly decentralized today. You can go through and still most of the votes are held by a small number of people, namely the VCs and uh, team members who contribute to the project. Moreover, someone can just go and buy up all the tokens. And based on the rules of some of these votes, um, you know, they would be able to push hypothetically whatever they wanted. Another issue for DAOs today is attention management. Um, so a lot of people have been excited about DAOs and kind of holding many different tokens that confer uh, utility and, and access. Um, but there's an issue that very few people actually care enough to vote, uh, kind of a tragedy of the commons of sorts. So generally there's kind of a question of uh, what are the best practices and tools to keep people who are involved in the DAO engaged um, additionally, there's an issue with treasury management and financial planning. Unlike a regular traditional corporation, there is no CFO and there isn't really someone paying attention for how to best use the capital. Also, in the context of a DAO, it's a lot more confusing to figure out uh, comp. So people um, are used to coming into a company and being told or negotiating their salary. Uh, this becomes like a lot more confusing when everything is transparent and potentially voted on. And so there's definitely like a lot of work that needs to be done here and, and different projects working on ways to make compensation more algorithmic and maybe follow more directly from the contributions that someone makes. But for now, a lot of the strategies are pretty old school, just with um, everything being transparent. So, you know, a proposal to, to hire someone a certain rate, proposal mm -hmm to give someone a salary increase or to a proposal to allocate budget to this working group that's gonna be doing this. It's very inefficient right now. And so this is a big area where we need to see improvement. There's also a lot of legal ambiguities on the status of DAOs in different jurisdictions, uh, when it comes to tax treatment, when it comes to the category that the DAO tokens, if they have tokens falls into. So for example, we talked earlier about the joint stock company and how the big innovation over there was the se separate legal personality of the entity. Um, and so of course, uh, for DAOs, you have this separate personality in the on-chain world, in the, in the software universe, but does the law still look at that as a se separate legal personality if the DAO never registered in any particular jurisdiction? And then maybe your liability is limited in the blockchain context. Like, of course you can't lose more money than you put into an investment DAO, let's say, but you know, if someone in the outside world uh, sues the DAO for wrongdoing, could that jurisdiction decide to go after individuals in the DAO uh, for uh, their personal monies? Um, and, and also, again, with tax treatment, this is very confusing, uh, blurry lines right now, where if uh, money is being uh, generated, um, invested, returned in smart contracts, that are sort of transnational that thousands of people sit anonymously have partial control over, you know, who pays, who pays taxes on that? Uh, to what extent is it a separate entity with its own tax treatment? And to what extent does it, does it pass through uh, to the participants if they're even identifiable? Right, so we talked a lot about problems and now briefly we can touch on some of the solutions out there. With tokens, uh, there's this issue of people 
uh, buying up and subverting the governance, making it less decentralized. And so Curve uh, has this concept that others have adopted of V tokens, where instead of one token, one vote, you lock up your token. And the longer you lock it up for, the more vote escrowed tokens you get. And so your, your relative share of the profits and voting rights is relative to the number of tokens and length of time that you've locked your tokens up for. And so this can address kind of a problem of malicious actors trying to buy up the token and make bad decisions because people who have more lock-in uh, have more power. And so that would lead to more um, long-term decision-making. Also with the issue of attention management, you have compound governance has implemented a delegation as a native feature of their uh, governance framework where I can own the tokens, but I can delegate my voting rights to somebody else. And you could see this getting a lot more sophisticated over time with transitive delegation, where maybe I delegate part of mine to this person and that person, and then maybe that person delegates to someone else and the votes pass through and it's incredibly transparent what every person in that chain is doing, including the end voter and what they're voting on. So if, if someone makes start making decisions I disagree with, um, I, can, I can revoke my delegation. So kind of like a more sophisticated representative democracy that's more delegative. Another mechanism out there, concept of, of rage quit, it's, it's for investment DAOs. And in any moment, anyone who contributed capital can, if there's a decision they disagree with, there's a delay in between the decision being made and executed. And it actually is autonomous. It's just a time delay. Um, and, but you can actually pull out your funds, the proportional share of the funds you have before the decision gets executed if you strongly disagree with it. And then on the bottom right we're here, we have uh, conviction voting, which is an interesting solution also for attention management, as well as treasury management and um, contributor compensation, where basically the more money that is trying to be spent in a proposal, the, the higher relative share of voting power it requires to get passed. So let's say we have a million dollars in our treasury and I want to spend a hundred bucks, you know, maybe like a uh, 0.1% uh, people need to vote. But if I want to spend, you know, 200K, maybe, okay, maybe that's going to take actually 10% or 30%. And so you can have this more like dynamic algorithmic uh, quorum to make actions happen faster that are lower risk and require more consensus around higher risk uh, actions. And so the broader point here is that since it's software, there's a wide open design space for kind of any mechanism that anyone can imagine to solve these problems. Unlike in, um, let's say, nation states and corporations where you know, these templates are very rigid, um, they're baked into legal codes that take enormous amounts of efforts to change. And there's enormous amount of inertia kind of keeping that system as is. Uh, people want to go the least path of resistance, don't want to spend lots of legal fees, and don't want to risk violating legal codes. And so they stick with the, with the defaults. And so we can quickly go through some resources. We'll share the link. Yeah, there's, there's a kind of whole exploding ecosystem of tooling for launching DAOs, for contributor compensation and project management. We have some discovery tools to kind of go out and like find all the different DAOs out there, token issuance and fundraising. So because um, of how composable Web3 is, you don't actually have to use the same tool for governance as you use maybe for issuing your token. Maybe you're not ready to decentralize governance, but you want to start doing the issuance side. There's tools like Mirror and Coinvise that like make it very easy to just like issue a token and start sending it out. And then later on, you could then plug that token into Snapshot for using the tokens in a voting system. Uh, there's also newer tools here that allow uh, fundraising to happen with, with the tokens. Uh, when we talk about that utility or that access bracket of the usages of a token, the rights that it confers, uh, there's a growing ecosystem of token gated permissions. So you can use a token say, okay, you, you need this token or this amount of this token to be in this chat room or to be in this discussion forum because we don't want to, maybe we have thousands of token holders, but we only want like the top uh, 50 to be able to, to engage in like the conversations in this category. And then also linking these into other existing systems. For example, Guild allows you to token gate access to Discord channels. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, um, do you believe that community members always truly know what they want and can make decisions that will lead to a better product? And if it depends, which of the categories that you mentioned do you feel like are better suited for community governance? I think 
currently there's a limited, like a narrow range of use cases where this would be very helpful because of the limitation of the tools. And so for example, this past year, we saw very, very simplistic DAOs take off, like let's buy the constitution and decide where to display it. But if you're doing something like product development, that might still work better in the startup context, depending on what kind of like a uh, product it is. And then territorial governance is definitely super interesting, but untested. If you have a community where people are actually living, it could make sense since people tend to prefer a democracy anyways in, in territorial situations that you would do that on chain. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in there as well quickly that um, for things such as product development, I mean, there's kind of a reason why for many years and including now there's like people working full-time on products and like oftentimes community members may be well-intentioned, but like they just don't have the full scope of context or, or like the amount of time working on something. Other no questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, let's say you're like a spiritual organization who wants to convert to it now if you're not super technically experienced. Um, are there any kind of aspects out there that let you basically create your own DAO like at the same time? Yeah, there's definitely uh, non-technical ways to make a DAO. So a lot of the DAO launchers that we showed in the previous slide are just GUIs that you just need like a Web3 wallet to use. You'll definitely be limited in the mechanism design to whatever the designers of those tools have, have built. And I think the other part of the question was about maybe the, the legal entity or converting an existing yeah. company. Yes. Yeah, so... so it's been, tr it's been um, happening more and more that a lot of uh, crypto projects that started off as traditional companies to develop their protocol or whatever they're building decided at some point to decentralize. So Shapeshift is a good example of this, which is it was like a traditional kind of like company set up to operate a crypto exchange. And they managed to get all the pieces of their uh, system to be decentralized and, and like kind of smart, smart contract governed. And so eventually they announced that they're like dissolving their foundation or their corporation to uh, pass off governance to the Shapeshift DAO. And they dropped the token, you know, to some of the people from the former corporation, but then also to lots of their users and yeah, had, had it become a DAO form. Okay. Yeah, follow up. Uh, and you mentioned uh, these point and click mechanisms for launching DAOs. Could you provide us one or two of the big that perhaps? Is there a good example you can point to for these point and click mechanisms? Yeah, I think uh, DAO House is one of the easiest to use. And then, and then Gnosis Safe is interesting because I wouldn't say it's a DAO framework, but it is actually the most popular tool to do DAO-esque things. It's, more, it's a multi-signature wallet. So it lets you easily spin up, um, let's say a really simple DAO. Hey. Um, hi, Ari and Ron. Could you uh, tell us about how some DAOs do their recruiting and onboarding process, especially if DAOs looking for a certain type of people are going to web two interview processes. Um, thank you. So it's very online. I mean, it's Twitter and Discord in forum posts and then word of mouth. And so you could go to a website like DeepDAO, for example, look at some of the DAOs there and then click on where their forum is, which that kind of info is embedded there. And then you can, you'll, you'll be right into the, in the action of what's going on, what decisions are being talked about. Maybe this is a little section for like hiring needs. I think another big one is crypto conferences in different parts of the world that a lot of these like organizations and representatives from them will go to, to share latest updates and recruit. All right. How do you think about the ability for DAOs to raise um, capital early on, especially when a lot of individual investors may not be able to own tokens yet um, or kind of familiar with direct equity investment? People who want to invest in these things are changing their mandates and increasingly are being able to buy, invest in tokens, mm -hmm. not just in equity. So the world is evolving yeah. to, to meet the needs from both sides. Yeah, I would totally agree with that answer. A lot of them are either changing their, their rules to be able to have access to this new asset class. And then also just lots of new crypto funds are getting started. So you have a tool like Syndicate DAO, which lets people form online investment clubs. So I think you're seeing like this new breed of investor be born also that's like internet native. So there's a question from somebody remotely. What is that? Um, do you think the reduced speed of decision-making is difficult for DAOs to be competitive? 
quick decision can actually make things work. Yeah, if you want to uh, move fast and be efficient, so you start a corporation. If you want to leverage talent from around the world, start a DAO, right? So that's the stage we're at now. I think these trade-offs will be overcome with time, with tooling, but definitely that is a trade-off today. So anything that requires like, like hyper-competitive, quick decisions, um, small teams is going to uh, experience friction going the DAO route. You think we'll have hybrids where there's a corporate structure for a lot of types of decisions and for certain types of things that are DAOs? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, we already have that with uh, most of these popular DAOs today. Like Uniswap, um, it has its DAO, but then there's Uniswap Labs that works on the development and kind of chooses its own company agenda. And a DAO can delegate uh, kind of different votes or tokens to a corporation that kind of has its own initiatives. Um, kind of the other thing to add to Ori's quote for kind of uh, if you want to do things uh, fast, go as a corporation. There's kind of generally a classic quote of if you want to go fast, go alone. Uh, and if you want to go far, go together. All right. Well, let's um, give Ron and Ori a really big hand. <laughs>